So everything's available to us. Um, and just like, you know, I use the analogy of colors on the palette, right? Like we don't get our palette ready to paint and put blue, 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 right? We want paint, but we want all different colors. So we come here to express that oneness in a unique frequency that is us, like a color or a song or a vibration or a frequency. And, um, and so we're still the paint, you know, like we're still the drop in the ocean we're still the entire ocean. So instead of being like, I'm just a drop, I can't do it. It's like, no, remember the you that is the ocean and how to access that. And, um, and that's for me, like, that's why I paint, <laughs> right. Um, is to help like, okay, I know this, but still feels a little clunky down here on earth on the day to day. So I'm going to take it to the canvas and I'm going to paint it and I'm going to focus on it and I'm going to um, get to know it on an intimate level. And I feel like, and I'm curious about your creations because, and this has come up from other people recently um, in a way that is bringing it to the forefront of my consciousness again, that, that I do believe there is something unique that happens unique and like clearer stronger energetically when as women let's just say as women we go into our creative practice with the intention of connecting to our divine self to our most authentic self um to the divine feminine that there's an extra like boost like you know it's like having you know really high-speed internet as opposed to dial-up or something that when you engage in that creative frequency because that is the feminine that's shakti right that she can come through and co-create with us and through us that much more potently because we're we're in that same vibration together um so your how did you start making your sacred art and talismans and um I was an artist, as, as I said, a gallery artist working in lots of different mediums. And um, my pieces were getting more and more ephemeral. I was starting to work with uh, doing women's handwork and like stitching, but every stitch was a prayer. I was wanting to make objects, you know, I was connecting into my an ancestors and I was wanting to connect with them, which has now become a big part. But this was probably um more than a decade ago I started yeah more I started doing women's handwork and labor to try to and you know like knitting with bones and sticks and trying to like understand how my grandmothers did that and kind of finding the cellular memory in my body as I did those things and I was a terrible knitter by the way but um I just still was like wanting to converse and do things because I knew I'd given birth, I was cooking, I was growing food, I was wanting to understand what was their life like and where can they intersect with me because I felt like there was a body of knowledge that was for me to access that was still alive, still in me, but it was unawakened and I wanted to kind of call it forth. But in that process, my gallery dropped me because my pieces got so ephemeral. And then I was like, I'm done. I'm done with the gallery. And I had a situation in my life that was so devastating. I had a very deep, dark night of the soul. And it wasn't the first, but this one took me out. It, I, I cried multiple times a day for about a year and a half. And I was like, I've got to stop this. And so then I started meditating. And I meditated two to six hours a day to kind of call myself back. And then I was like, okay, I'm done with art. I'm, I don't need to make any more objects. I'm just going to meditate. I went to my studio, I meditated, and I started offering meditations to teach people how to inhabit their multidimensionality, how to bilocate, how to uh, remote view, how to, because, because when I was meditating two to six hours a day, like when you're in meditation for six hours, the veils begin to dissolve. It is, it just becomes a different world. And so that was the start of me just being in communion, like my offering, what's my creative offering through this other side? How can I reach the other side? And in the process of that, making those offerings that uh, those meditations in my studio is called Coherent Field Project. And they were crazy. Like, oh my God, it was crazy what would take place in my studio. It was 
studios are sacred temples. And it just became more of a temple. And I had all my, I had my artwork up, but I was just like, everyone just come in. We're just going to meditate for four hours <laughs> it's gonna, or meditate for two hours and two hour group meditation. And in the process of that, I was given um, a carte blanche to do um, an installation. And they were like, what would you like to do as a public art installation? And I was like, oh, I've always wanted to make bronze sculptures like Kiki Smith. I was like, I could do anything I want. I have any budget. I was like, oh my God. So I was like, okay, I'm going to learn how to cast in bronze. And so, and I started working with the indigenous people. And that was, I was working with the Chicheno, the Ohlone people, who are the people of Berkeley. Um, and that was Berkeley, California. And I was starting to collaborate with them. And it became very clear to me that I needed to identify, this is a long answer, um, what my ancestral relationships were to earth and land through my uh, indigenous relationships, through my ancestral relationships, as I held conversations with these people, because my work was about indigenous um, animals and language and plants. And so this is all taking place. I'm sitting on the land, listening, sitting on that urban corner, you know, at night, listening, what needs to emerge here? How do I do this? And listening, listening, and forming wax into uh, native animals, the snakes and different creatures and lizards and having a really hard time. It was very hard to make a real, I'm not a, I don't make realistic things. I'm very, you know, inspired. And uh, and at one point I was like in tears and I was like, I said to the wax, I was like, show me what I can make. Like I can't make this, I can't. And th this form of the Gaia came through and it's always, as it always is, it's like, I don't know what it is. And I finish it and I'm like, it's in wax. And I'm like, well, what is it? And they're like, it's a ceremonial tool. It's a, it's a woman's ceremonial knife. And I was like, huh? And they're like, yeah, this is for the, for Gaia. And this is, and I, I had been going through a period of being really disturbed by the appropriation of tools. I see someone, they say like, oh, this is from, you know, a Tibetan monastery, or this is from a a shaman or this is a native american shaman i was like you shouldn't have that like wait where's the white people's tools like where's my ancestors tools you should not have that precious item from that shaman or that teacher or that monastery or that temple you should not have that that was taken probably or bought at a cheap rate because it was poverty like that those sacred tools should be on their landscape they should be with the people that's those are those are heirlooms, you know, those are cultural and family heirlooms. You should not have one. And I was like, oh, when this came through, I was like, Gaia, okay, I'm going to start making tools for Europeans. Um, so, but I had this, I made, I made one in bronze and I carried it around in my pocket. I wasn't determined to make a series at that time, but I would show it to people and be like, I want one. And I was like, hmm. And then I started making them in multiples and immediately other forms came through. And I was like, well, who's the overlighting goddess? Brigid came through and just one by one, a form would come through in a deity. I, I'd hear a name, Brigid. I'd be like, well, who's that? I have to go look her up. Freya, who's that? And I have to go look her up. Same thing. I would just, I would just hear the name. I'd be like, okay. And then I would have to do a deep dive into understanding what it was. So your question was about tapping into. So I have a rule that whenever I'm working on my, working on the deity blades, gods and goddesses, that I have to be connected to that deity. I have to be in honor. I have to be in a good space. Like I can't, I can't work on these things when I'm angry and pissed and distracted. And then I think about the frequency of that being, that deity and what they represent, you know, while I'm working on them and while I'm working on the machinery and the machinery, all the big machinery that you work to do, metal uh, cleaning up and polishing and grinding has its own thing. It's got its own field going on. It's got sounds and tones and resonances and things get very hot and I work with flames and, you know, blow torches. And, and so I have to be attuned to that deity while I'm working on the piece. It's just, otherwise I don't, I'm not going to do it. It's for that deity. So that's one, that's one answer. That's the deity thing. But tapping into the divine feminine or our own authentic nature as a fractal of divinity, I think is really important. And I think that when you're, you know, each of us are a fractal of this divine 
manifestation mandala. But we can't really be our glowing, bright fractal unless it's truly authentic and truly us. And that's what's needed right now. We need to inhabit our own unique fractal of the mandala in order for the mandala to become whole. So tapping into what's mine to say, what's, and this is something we've lost the skill set to because we've been programmed to be more like and more like and more like so that we are forgetting who we really are. We've forgotten, as you, you talked about that, in this great amnesia of our unique expression. And that is super essential to find out, wait, what is mine to express, you know, on canvas or singing or in the garden or with my food or just the way I dress, you know, what is mine to express? And often a canvas, you know, making art because it doesn't have a place that nobody's going to eat it. You don't need to make money off of it. It actually can be private. Nobody has to see it is a really great place to experience. What is my authentic expression? So you setting the container, you said setting the space for it is really vital, so vital to have a space where you can go and explore what is mine, who is mine, who am I, what can come through. And sometimes people find that, well, it's not the canvas, but once they've, once they've tapped into what that feels like, that kind of tone, you know, you can take it out into other mediums. I mean, maybe you, right now I'm playing a lot of music. I find I jump from mediums to find if I get caught up and I can't remember what I'm doing, I switch mediums. So that I can be like, oh, here, this one, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to play some music and, you know, forget about all that. And, uh, and then the divine feminine, you know, tapping into the divine feminine for the work, that's a whole other thing, which is that there's all these faces of the feminine that need to be re-anchored. They need to be anchored again into this reality because they've been forgotten you know they've been forgotten you know there's a i just have so many they're like please let us come back because you think that you're you've got the whole game humans have been cut off from this massive resource of support and wisdom knowledge that's ancient you can tap into your past lifetimes your ancestors lifetimes all these powerful mystical lineages all these beings the angels the deities the spirit guides the star kin like they're there to help us so by creating artwork that is speaking or addressing them, you're kind of, or your ancestors, you're creating these sort of fields and pathways to these resources and intelligence and wisdom bodies. Um, so I noticed you had done a series like a Tara painting, you know, like I was like, oh, that's really great. You know, this is a way to tap into the Tara is 21 faces. She represents just about every aspect of human consciousness. And so choose a Tara. I don't know how you did it exactly, but I was like, yeah, Tara, that's a great form of divinity to make an offering, open up to receive, stand in your authentic place and speak and receive because she's, she's a mom. She's got it all. Like, what's your problem? I've got it. I've got it now. I can facilitate. She's so old, you know? And so, yeah, you know, that's so those to me, those are all like three different ways just because I'm, that's who that's how yeah. but yeah so tell me about when you buy tell me the answer to your own question answer back to me um or tell me about the tara how the tara inspiration do you address mm -hmm. the 21 taras when you do your work when you hold that workshop do you yeah so um so what so one thing is that um the way i roll is that like i said you know something someone an an entity a divine you know tara bridget freya um come to me and i when i want to get to know them which i do at the canvas like that's how i get to know them and and then two i want to share so so tara came through because um and i had painted a yellow tara slash lakshmi very magical painting um and and I was talking with the woman who helps me with my business about doing some special, um, you know, low price point entry offer in September, 2020 to lead up to my coaching certification. And, um, and I was like, oh, I could add a new lesson to the Buddha painting course, um, which painting Buddha, that's a whole other story, but I had been around for years and lots and lots of people painted Buddha. 
gotten to know Buddha as a result. And um, I'm like, I'll add something new and kind of say, oh, join in September, special new edition Buddha and do some live, you know, things and all that. And as I'm talking to her, um, I, I hear, which for me, it's, I'm claircognizant. So I get the thought and the thought was paint the feminine Buddha. And I was like, oh, Dawn, I could paint Tara. And then I hear, I have 21 aspects. And I'm like, she has 21 aspects. Dang, it's a whole new course. And this is August, 2020. This studio was like the, this board, you know, the wall was just being installed. It was just the OSB, not painted, not caulked, which I did all that. Um, and it's paragliding season. So like, if it's flyable, I just want to fly. So August is not when I create entirely new programs, right? But I mean, it was like, I mean, it wasn't like, okay, yay, I'll paint Tara. There was lots of resonance, but it was like, right now, really? It was like, okay, okay, I'll do it, right? So I um, I found a book um, by Rachel Wooten um, about Tara, which is an amazing book. I, like I'm spacing the name of the book right now. It's probably right over there. Um, but Rachel Wooten, Green Tara, whatever. And she goes through her 21 aspects. And so I'm like, I will share with people because I kind of started down the road of wanting to learn her aspects years before and it kind of stopped. And so I'm like, I'm going to read this book. And I reached out to Rachel to say, can I, you know, can we use your book? And she and I did Zooms and all that. And so I would read a chapter and then paint a symbol or an image from the chapter on the canvas. So the canvases are, you know, 22 uh, layers or elements to, that come together to create your unique Tara. Um, so, so I launched that program like September 9th, 2020, right? So right pandemic, um, I had like nine of the 22 lessons done, you know, um, and it was incredible you know, how in that first month there were like 900 people joined and um, it was, wow. Okay. So, you know, it's such an amazing example, kind of similar to what you're saying, as far as, you know, you get the, your marching orders, so to speak, when you open up. Right. And, um, and so, so yeah, so Tara's kind of a whole pantheon in and of herself. Right. I mean, she, her between you know her and her 21 aspects um there's she's everything um and before then you know i'd painted yellow tara lakshmi i'd painted um, um freya i'd painted aspects of me like divine feminine aspects of me that helped me understand um who i was like i painted one that started out just very abstractly and I remember thinking like I'm not going to try and paint anything and I was just kind of dragging paint across the canvas and then I flipped it and I saw like this woman's figure and a shield and um, she ended up kind of flying soaring over this teeny tiny town that was down in the bottom of the canvas and she had an owl on her shoulder um, which is why I now have this big owl tattoo on my shoulder because I'd always say that and then Athena and, um, and when I looked at her, I was like, okay, this is the part of me that wants to focus way more and prioritize way more this higher perspective, you know, where the little details, like I'm not a really good detail person, mm -hmm. um, but so the little details fade away, right? And, and life on earth as we know it as, you know, 3D human matrons, whatever, um, becomes just this tiny pinprick compared to like what's available to us. And so that was like a self-declaration of like, I'm going to live from that place. You know, I'm going to live from what is still important when I raise my perspective, you know, when I raise my vibration, what's important and, and living from that place. And so um, she doesn't have a name per se, right? But I recognized her as an aspect of the divine feminine who was mirroring for me um, an aspect of me that was inside that I hadn't, you know, been able to, to kind of describe or quantify or, or witness because she was just in there. Um, so, so I felt like getting to know and 
painting is how I get to know the divine feminine is getting to know parts of me. And, um, and I felt like in meditation, there was one time I was distracted by this recurring thread of like how to help him understand, you know, years after the divorce. And, and I heard the goddess again, just like thoughts, but she was just like, enough, stop thinking about the man. <laughs> like he's got everything he needs. Do you know how long we've been waiting to have strong, independent, creative women on the ground, on earth to move through? And whenever you're tempted to think about him, think about me. And it was like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> oh. Right? Like, and yeah. so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, I do a lot with meditation as well. Um, and there have been times that I, not so much now, because, because of so many of us, people are understanding the sacredness of a creative practice and that it's not just about being good at painting or drawing and all that. But there was a time where I was kind of curious about how can I not do the painting? Can I not have to hear, oh, I'm afraid if I can't even draw a straight line, blah, blah, blah. You know, um, and then it was like, no, what you're offering is a place and a practice where people can go and connect to their own inner wisdom, their own divine feminine. You know, it's not about me and, and it's never, I've never, like, it's always felt very much like everything's coming through me from the very beginning. I opened an art center with no art training. So like right away, it was like, I have to let go and not count on myself and just follow the prompts, right? Um, so it's always been about that. Um, so just keep having this conversation and offering this creative practice and creating space for people to explore it so that they can connect themselves to their own infinite creative being, however that wants to express, right? Um, and I love it. I mean, it's like, wow, it's so fun. And it's changed over the years, right? Like 28 years ago, I was talking about right, left brain and comparing them to muscles, you know? So as, as the frequencies change and evolve, you know, as does, the conversation I think you know we're all having just like you leaving the gallery right to to launch into this whole other aspect of yourself which clearly for me now feels so much more potent and of service to the divine feminine than creating for the gallery audience nothing wrong with that it's just right. different and I'm glad you're here in this space <laughs> thank you 